morning. Come on, I could do, I think I could do better than that. <laughs> uh, almost a full house, so that's not too bad. I was, I was hoping it would be better than this. But let's get started anyway, because what you just saw today here, I hope it sets the stage for what's happening, going to happen today. And I hope you're ready to rock, because we have the biggest rock star of Silicon Valley coming up here on this stage in the next 30 seconds. The rock star, the rock star that is, uh, is on a mission to take us to a different realm, democratize AI, put it all over the place. A rock star who has taken the company that he's founded 30 years ago from 400 billion to 1.2 trillion in the last 18 months. A rock star who has taken this company's stock up 550% in five years and half of that happened in the last 12 months. <laughs> so. Of course, the rock star is none other than founder and CEO of Jensen Huang. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jensen Huang. Folks, there you go. Jensen. Yeah, that's you. Yeah, please. Am I? Yeah, here? yeah, yeah. Okay. Jensen, how to do this, not just behalf of IIT Barry Alumni Association and in behalf, on behalf of the entire IIT community. Thank you. Thank you. For being here on a Saturday morning, in spite of your crazy, busy schedule, and I know that for sure. I've been working with your awesome team for the last five months to make this happen. Ooh, it's happening. And, uh, <laughs> Well, I think, folks, that speaks about who our rock star is. So, I don't want to waste any time because there is a reason we got him here. There's a lot to unpack and unpack, but here's uh, where it gets interesting. Um, like any rock star, Jensen is traveling today with his band, Rock Band. And there's something special about this rock band. It's not only the band, band members he has handpicked, they're all from IIT. Yeah, yeah. There must be a reason Jensen did that. I'm not sure whether it's because he didn't go to IIT, but we'll figure that out. So, uh, without uh, wasting any more time, let me call up the band. They're going to be in conversation with Jensen to unpack and unplug him. So, uh, let me first call up Raj, Raja Gopalan, Vice President of Go to Market and Operations. I've been working with Raj to, uh, to, to construct this session. Raj, looking forward to a great session. <laughs> Next up, Vivek Singh, Vice President of Advanced Technology Group and Media. Vivek is uh, from IIT Delhi. Raj is from IIT Bombay. And uh, last but not the least, Samir. Alpete. Sorry. Nice meeting, Samir. Samir is from uh, IIT Bombay, too. I'm okay. okay. I raised Samir. <laughs> okay. I'm going to get out of here. Raj, Jensen, Vivek, Samir, the stage is yours. We are looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we need to work on that. Yeah, we need to work on that. Okay. Let's uh, get this started. Jensen, I'd like to start by saying congratulations. There has not been a person, and I'm not saying by my knowledge, I'm just saying there's not been a human being who has started their small startup company under such humble surroundings in a Denny's, and then for 30 years been CEO of that, and led it through huge amounts of stress, lots of ups, lots of downs. And day in, day out, toiled at some things that you believed in. And today, your company is worth a trillion dollars. Only six companies are in that ratified league. And you did this by making a lot of strong, bold bets. Two of the most well-known bets are on accelerated computing and AI. And you bet on this a dozen years ago, when people could barely spell 
AI or accelerated computing. And today, you saw the potential at that time, and you steadfastly kept investing in this. Today, everybody sees the potential. With this kind of a track record, the audience here, what we want most to hear from you is, where do you see the future going? Where is this technology going to evolve to? How is it going to impact our lives? How is it going to impact the GDP and the companies that make up the global economy? What is the next wave of innovation going to look like? How should we prepare ourselves to capitalize on it? Your thoughts, Chancellor. Well, this sounds like it's going to be a one-question interview. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's see. Um, I think I think we know now, and I think we all know now that that um, the last sixty years of computing has been has been extraordinary. Uh, we utilized a a form of computing that was introduced in 1964, the year after I was born. Uh, by IBM called the IBM six, System 360. And I don't know how many of you have read the manuals of the System 360 I have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, uh, I hope none in, in the room actually wrote it. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but it, it, covered, it covered some uh, really important concept. Uh, central processing unit, I.O. subsystem, DMA, uh, virtual memory, multitasking, uh, 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 scalable architecture, uh, backwards compatibility. Uh, what else is left? I think we described all of the computer industry in the last 60 years. And this, this general purpose way of doing software uh, recognized that, that um, the cost of computing is in software, not in hardware. And it's sensible because you use a computer for a very long time. And so the body of software that accumulates over that computer architecture grows over time, and that body of work can't be wasted. That recognition was profound, um, and it changed the computer industry. Anyway, uh, uh, almost everybody who made an impact in the computer industry uh, really, really recognized the System 360's teachings, if you will, uh, as the governing dynamics of the computer industry. Well, that way of scaling computing uh, lasted 60 years. However, general purpose computing, as the world continued to um, uh, scale, uh, ran out of steam. And the reason for that is, is when you start to use general purpose anything over time, the energy efficiency or the effic cost efficiency or any efficiency uh, is squandered. And, and uh, we, we got to a point where uh, now the, the, the capacity of computing, uh, the demands on computing are so great that general purpose computing ways are uh, really quite expensive to, to use going forward, uh, particularly for, for energy efficiency reasons. And, and so we've been working on, on a new class of computing, a new form of computing called accelerated computing. And it, um, in a lot of ways, we're the only parallel computing architecture that ever survived. And the only the reason why we're the only parallel computing architecture that ever survived is because we obeyed Anvil's law. Almost all of the other forms of parallel computing disobey Anvil's law. I mean, I almost looked at Anvil's law, looked at it in its face, and, and say, you know, uh, we're going to overcome Anvil's law. And it, it, uh, on first principles, it doesn't make any sense. Anvil's law is a good law. And, and um, uh, we, we were sensible about it, and we added a parallel computing processor, uh, an accelerator next to the CPU, next to general purpose compute. And we offloaded and accelerated the workloads that were particularly good uh, for our domain. And, and we, worked at, we worked at it for a very long time. Now, there, there was a lot of reasons why, why uh, parallel computing shouldn't survive, and, and, and we can go into it. But, but, um, uh, but at this point, I think it's fairly clear that in order for us to continue to expand um, computing into the, the type of workloads we're interested in, uh, general purpose computing will, will, will have to be 
augmented by accelerated computing. And, and uh, we now have about a trillion dollars worth of computing in the world, maybe a, maybe a trillion and a half dollars worth of computing installed over the course of the next decade or so, uh, probably less than that. You know, most S curves, that, you know, once, once an S curve gets going, uh, it takes a little bit less than a decade or so. In the next 10 years, I'm fairly certain that every computer in the world will be accelerated, every data center will be accelerated, um, all of the infrastructure software will be accelerated. Uh, everything will continue to be software, software programmable and software defined, uh, but accelerated computing will, will um, uh, pretty much take over the vast majority of computing. Now, the, the, question, the question you asked about where is computing going uh, and AI has to do with with um, uh, uh, several things. I, maybe the way to answer that is to think about computing in, in the three layers. Um, how would computers be designed? And I just mentioned that uh, accelerated, it would be accelerated for sure. Um, the second is how would software uh, be created and, and what would software be able to do? Uh, we know now, we know now that, that um, we've defined a new type of, of uh, software which is Almost, if there are any any hardware designers in the room, um, it's almost it's it's almost developing software the way that that hardware is developed, the way chips are developed, in a structured sort of way. Um, deep learning, deep learning, as you know, is is uh, uh, using data to uh, train a a, um, uh, a function, and this function is a universal function approximator uh, because it. it it could be it could be uh, stacked up in layers, and each one of the layers could be trained individually uh, because of these activation functions that that separates each one of the layers from another layer. Uh, you could build software as tall as you wanted to build it, and because you could build software as tall as you like and as wide as you like, uh, the dimensionality of the function you would like to approximate could be as great as you like. And and um, and so that that observation about 13 years ago led us to believe that we've discovered a universal function approximator. The universal function approximator then says, wherever you have data, you could create a function approximator that can predict the future. And what can you apply this for? And so so now you have this you know, universal function approximator. Um, you, you know that we've, we've uh, largely, largely tackled computer vision, we've largely tackled speech recognition, uh, we've largely tackled uh, time sequence uh, approximation and prediction, uh, we've largely tackled uh, uh, many of the things that you guys know uh, that, that uh, we're, we're uh, able to solve today. And to the point where we've largely tackled uh, uh, natural language understanding. And, and so the question is, is what else can you uh, learn with a universal function approximator like this? Well, almost anything that has structure. That's the, the simple, simple idea. Uh, if language has structure, it obviously has structure because I, I can uh, somehow, somehow create language that you can also understand. And if that's the case, then we, we obviously both recognize uh, the same structure. We both understand the, the, the governing laws of how that structure is, is put together, the, the, the vocabulary, the syntax, the grammar, uh, the semantics. Uh, we, we understand the structure of language. Well, what else do we understand? Of? Well, we understand the structure of the physical world. Uh, if, we, if we don't, then we would all be biologically completely different, and we're not. We're similar. Okay, so there's, there's got to be some structure in biology that we can, we can learn. There's obviously structure in the physical world. Uh, if there wasn't structure in the physical world, we'd be white noise right now, right? And so somehow atomically, uh, we gather into this kind of a structure. And, uh, there's structure in, in uh, the things that we created. We created words, we created chairs and tables and stages, and we created these things. And because we created these, these things and we gave them words, uh, the words and the, and the structures are somehow related. We can learn that. So we can learn we can learn text to 3D, we can learn text to image, we can learn text to uh, almost anything. Okay, and so almost anything that has structure, well, we know physics has structure. Otherwise, 
if physics has no structure, then tomorrow morning will be different than this morning. And it, it, it didn't. You know, I, I was able to stand up the same way, and right. And so, so there are predictable structures. Uh, we could therefore use use uh, deep learning to uh, learn multi-physics. We can we can use it to learn the language of protein. We can use it to learn the language of genes. We can use it to learn the language of chemistry, uh, the language of physics. We can use it to predict weather. Obviously, we can use it to predict uh, climate. Hopefully, um, and so the type of things that we can now use this universal function approximator to do uh, is pretty profound. It's pretty exciting. And then the, the third layer after that, just a, you know, a, a short answer to your very <laughs> life. You know, the, the, the Raj asked you a question. Basically, you're going to spend the rest of your life chasing. <laughs> <laughs> this is the this is what's the meaning of life question. Um, the, the the last the last part the last layer I, that I'm excited about, um, and I kind of kind of hinted at it already, is is um, there there are two areas where uh, all of us who are in the world of computing really haven't had a chance to. To, to deeply engage, and uh, these two areas we now know we, we have a language of. If it wasn't because of if it wasn't because of our ability to represent transistors and logical gates and functions in language, if we didn't have a language structure to it, like Verilog, for example, how would we actually design something complicated like we do today? We need to have a representation of the thing that we're trying to build that is. Um, on the one hand, very high in abstraction, so that we can represent represent our ideas as efficiently as possible, but also synthesizable down into lower level structures. Isn't that right? The the revolution of high level design 40 years ago, um, and I was I was lucky to to have been the first generation of engineers that was able to to engage high level design in logic synthesis and using computer aided design to revolutionize. How we design electronics. If it wasn't because of that representation, how would we be able to achieve what we achieve? Well, we're about to have that same high-level representation of biology. We can now represent things all the way as as low-level as genes to proteins to cells pretty soon, and, and we'll be able to represent these high-level things, concepts. And if we could do that, then our ability to design proteins that for example, could go in or design enzymes that can go and eat plastic and so that so that the ocean isn't isn't polluted by by this incredible thing that's just taking over the ocean. Um, so that we could eat carbon, that we can we can um, uh, capture carbon post. Uh, you know, we'd like to capture carbon before, but uh, ideally uh, even if you could po uh, post capture creation, carbon creation would be fine. And so so we can go. We can go, and of course, including um, life-saving disease. So I think that the, the days of protein design um, is coming along, and and that that is surely within the next decade. Computer-aided drug discovery and computer-aided biology, um, I think, is is uh, one of the next next frontiers. Uh, the other giant next frontier is is. Um, uh, finally, using computer-aided systems and digital technology to revolutionize the world's largest industries. Uh, we we generate the, the reason why the, the electronics industry is so uh, is moving so fast, and we design such amazing things today is because of, of efficiency. Uh, we don't waste time. We don't waste ideas. We don't waste transistors. We don't waste power. We don't waste anything. We focus on. On saving all of those things, when you you can't you can't be efficient in those ways without tools. If not for the work that you guys do, how would we possibly be able to drive energy efficiency to the levels that we do? Isn't that right? Now, just apply that same logic to construction. Are buildings over designed? Uh, basically, buildings are either under designed or they're over designed. But there are no buildings that are efficiently designed, and the reason for that is they can't simulate anything. Um, there are no factories that are properly designed, um, and there are no plants, chemical plants, that are efficiently designed. Everything is either over-designed or under-designed. You can tell when they're under-designed whenever there's some some you know extreme weather event, uh, an entire city gets gets demolished. They're under-designed. 
when they're over designed, uh, we end up with with uh, uh, with concrete jungles uh, that find they're safe, but unfortunately consumes too much concrete. And you guys know that concrete consumes a lot of uh, generates a lot of carbon. And so, so there there's a uh, an entire industry, trillions and trillions of dollars of industry, the world's largest industries, and it's what's called heavy industries that are completely under uh, under captured with under utilizing uh, digital technology. And so the question is, how do we solve that problem? Well, we have to represent physics. We have to represent um, the heavy industries, the language of heavy industries, which, as I described earlier, we now have a function, universal function approximator and that can learn the representation of heavy industry. Once we can learn heavy industry's representation, we will describe it as we describe it with Verilog. There will be words, there will be under, there will be ways that we represent heavy industry, which is physically based. There will be uh, way we, ways we represent biology, which was, you know, obviously biology based. We'll have languages that represent those things, and we'll have tools that allows us uh, to go and optimize it. Uh, simulate it, optimize, design it, simulate it, optimize it, um, and optimize it over time. And so, so I, I'm excited about about the next 10 years as we, because we've discovered this breakthrough of learning the language of these physical things, we can go represent it. And, uh, and, and this arises the reason why NVIDIA is working in these areas. And, uh, the work that we do with Clara has to do with uh, all of the work in uh, preparing ourselves for this digital biology revolution, uh, all of the work that we're doing Omniverse is to create that digital, the digital uh, bridge between the uh, physically based worlds and the digital based worlds. So that's it. Ten minute answer to you. <laughs> I'm afraid for the next question. <laughs> <laughs> which, which I have the honor to ask. <laughs> thank you, yes, thank you. By the way, um, this going Raj to runs to NVIDIA's worldwide operations. And so, so uh, you know, we, yep. <laughs> Field operations, when we take all of our ideas to market, it's, it's obviously uh, the, the go-to-market for our company is, is quite unique. Uh, and it was, it was really invented at NVIDIA. Um, and um, uh, the operations of it is, is uh, uh, really complicated. And, and so, so Raj and his team, Orchestrates all that. Really amazing work. Yes, I'm going to ask the next question. Uh, but by the way, I'm glad this is being recorded because I'm going to have to listen to the last answer a couple of times to make sure I understand <laughs> half of it, uh, as is often the case with me. A little slow. Uh, but my question, Jensen, is that um, you've taken on some really hard problems in computing and you've set goals that can seem quite audacious, at least at least in the beginning. So how do you select these problems, and how do you steer the team through the inevitable technological challenges that these problems will pose? Uh, so for, first of all, Vivek is working on um, computational lithography. And uh, as you know, we, we are shrinking transistors um, uh, at a relentless pace. Uh, but you also know you can shrink transistors, but you can't shrink atoms. And, and so there's a, there's a, there, we're pushing against uh, the physical limits. And lithography is, is the first step of the, the miracles of semiconductor physics. And, and um, uh, we're pushing well beyond uh, the limits of, of, um, uh, of, of light and, um, uh, and the ability to pattern these amazing things. And so, so um, uh, Vec is working on a revolutionary way of doing computational lithography. And, it, it, and you know, the work that you're doing today uh, sets the foundations for, for hopefully the next giant step, which is where, where um, AI and uh, semiconductor manufacturing is, is connected together in a, in a really, really, uh, really uh, integral way. Um, uh, we, we select problems like this one like the one that you're working on, based on several things. Uh, the first thing is, is uh, it's surprising to hear this, uh, but the, the easiest problems to succeed on are the ones that are the hardest to achieve. And the reason for that is because it, 
If nobody can do it, you just got to make sure that nobody else can do it. If it's hard for you, but everybody else can do it, then then, then that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, then you got to keep looking. <laughs> but it, you have to find a problem that is hard for everybody, universally everybody. And so, so first of all, in order to, to even understand what a problem that is hard, uh, that is universally hard for everyone, um, uh, that that requires a skill in itself. You have to be informed, um, and so. Uh, you, let me let me just assume that first uh, we are highly informed professionals, which uh, everybody in this room, uh, everybody in this room is. And so, so um, uh, you choose a problem that is incredibly hard to do. And the reason why that's the easiest is because it gives you time to go learn it. And and uh, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, if we chose time travel, for example, uh, we're all at exactly the same spot. Okay. <laughs> and so, so by the time that any of us ever figure it out, uh, you know, it, it, and, and, and there are some theories on you, how you might might be able to travel at the speed of light. Um, time travel is harder, but the speed of light travel, you know, I could actually imagine it. And and so so the question the question is is did you solve did you choose a problem that is insanely hard to solve? And then the second is something that somehow you're you're destined to solve. Um, and it has to it has to do with your own set of lenses. You know, if, if your if your perspective on the world, or your your all of your life's preparation, or your particular field of interest, or uh, because of the collection of people that I have around me, uh, for example, you guys, uh, the, the selection of the selection of problems that that I tend to go for are highly informed by the team that I have, and and, it's, and the team that I, that I, I have surrounding me. That's highly informed by my own personal interest and my own right self-selection. And before you know it, we are incredibly good at this particular field. And so that's kind of the second characteristic. And the third is is um, you have to choose a problem that that um, independent of it, of um, of uh, pain and suffering. Um, that's gonna that will guarantee to come from solving a hard problem. Uh, and that's going to take a long time. Uh, that you're going to continue to still love, and, and so I, I think the, the the problems that we all that we selected, and I'll give you some examples of it in, in just a second. Uh, computational photography, for example, uh, that I keep been working on it now for a solid three years, coming on four, right? And and uh, we haven't shipped a thing. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Uh, at the moment, at the moment, there's you know, at every moment, at every moment, we believe we will. Isn't that right? Um, <laughs> at every moment, we believe we will. But at any moment, we haven't shipped a thing. And so, so that that is in fact the that that's exactly the right sensation. We're on the right track, but we're not successful. We're on the right track, but we're not successful. And the reason why we're not successful is because it's hard. And you also know how many people are working on Kulitho in our company. It's coming up on hundreds. Isn't that right? And so here we are. We have hundreds of people working on something coming up on some four years. We haven't shipped the deadly squad. And, and we are absolutely convinced we will. And, and so that is that, that is that, that is that perfect circumstance. And in fact, um, you, could, you could argue that that's pain and long-term pain and suffering. Um, but it, it's the joy that we derive from, and, and every single week, uh, um, first thing on Monday, I, I, I look forward to seeing some results that you publish, and and um, uh, and, and, and it, it's just enough progress to keep you going. Isn't that right? Just enough progress to keep you going. And <laughs> and so that is innovation. You know, you, you have this long-term dream that you believe you can make a huge difference. Every single week, you're making some progress. There's always some setback, and and uh, be, but you believe it, you, you still believe it, and, and so I think that these three conditions is how we how we choose. Uh, what, what are some of the problems that we chose? Uh, it, it turns out the single best strategic decision we made was in 1993. 1993, we we realized um, we wanted to do two things: we wanted to accelerate computing, and um, uh, 
and most people don't 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 remember this anymore. But but people talk about this new computing framework that we created called CUDA, C U D A. But the C part of it we added about 20 years ago. The U D A was was a, a severe when we joined. We, we only had U D A. Um, it was 1993, 1994. Uh, we we invented a new way of, of um, accelerating um, uh, I O, uh, which is where uh, accelerated computing is attached as a form of I O. Uh, a, a virtualized accelerated I O subsystem uh, was invented in 1993, 1994, and we stuck with it this whole time uh, because we believe that someday uh, this form of computing will be will be essential because. Either we could solve problems that general purpose computing can't solve, so for, for example, computer graphics, um, or eventually general purpose computing will be will be too inefficient, it will run out of steam, and we, we believe that, we believe that for 30 years. General purpose anything will run out of steam, general purpose car, general purpose plane, general purpose boat, why would we have a general purpose everything? Um, over time, when the market matures and the demand for something becomes ubiquitous, you're going to have specialization. We have specialized everything. You know, we have specialized television. We have specialized bicycles. We have specialized everything. And so, why wouldn't we have specialized computing? And so, so we believe that general purpose is, is not the right answer um, long term. It's the perfect answer short term. And and so, um, we've believed this now for that for that entire time. The first thing that we chose, we said, how what problem can we choose? That can simul that's simultaneously insanely hard to solve, meaning it should be a sustainable problem. Uh, the more we solve it, the more the bigger the market. Uh, the bigger the market, the more R and D we can we can create. Uh, the greater the R and D we can solve even larger markets. And we came to the conclusion that 3D graphics was that sustainable problem that it would take uh, nearly forever to solve, and it has the the, the, you, the fractional percentage, a small percentage, that it might become a very large market. And the, the large market potential that we saw, that we chose, um, was influenced by our own surrounding at the time, which was uh, video games. And I think that, that um, uh, history would suggest that choosing 3D graphics, video games, as the, as the, uh, the, the foundational uh, market opportunity to drive our R&D was, quite frankly, the company's single greatest business decision. Now, uh, um, over time, over time, uh, and so we had to go create that market. Unfortunately, uh, this uh, the problem with that with that business plan. If you go back in 1993 and look at the business plan, uh, you have accelerated computing, which nobody wanted, right? Because everybody wanted central central processing units at the time. Um, Intel was was uh, front and center. Everything was about Intel. Everything was about CPUs. So, so we we invented an, um, a, a model of computing that nobody wanted um, for a, uh, a new technology, 3D graphics, that there's no uh, ecosystem for uh, for a market that doesn't exist. You know, you know, video games at the time, electronic arts at the time was 14 employees. Uh, Sega was uh, Nintendo was almost out of business, as you guys remember at the time. And so, so the uh, uh, these three factors doesn't make for a very good business plan. Um, and so, I, I wrote the business plan anyways, and uh, I, I didn't know how to do it, but I, I tried. And um, uh, I, nobody believed in the business plan. Come to think of it, but but the, if not for if not for um, uh, uh, my previous employer. Basically, told uh, Sequoia Capital and Sutter Hill that, that um, uh, Jensen's a good kid. And give him some money. And that, that was that was, I think, uh, I think the um, I think the only virtues we had um, uh, going. And Chris and Curtis were were um, uh, and and I had worked with uh, Andy Beckerstein. Uh, I don't know if you guys know Andy Beckerstein, but but indirectly, uh, Andy was the founder of Sun. Uh, gave the three of us really really great. Uh, Recommendations. The business plan, I think, I think, on merits, um, on any business plan that's written today, uh, should be funded. And, and um, uh, because you know, zero percent times zero percent times zero percent, you know, <laughs> so you know, that, that's that's a 
as, as close to an absolute zero. <laughs> and and so so I think I think um, uh, the benefit, however, of all of those choices um, uh, created a company that was was smart about investing in long term things and smart about making money along the way while pursuing a long term vision. And so, for example. All of the pieces of technology that we're using for Cool Info, as you know, we're making money from today. Is that all right? And so, because the building blocks of Cool Info are profitable today, we could support Cool Info for as long as we shall live. Um, because, because the in the beginning of deep learning, because our basic architecture was uh, able to do computing, even if deep learning was going to take 20 years, I would have funded it forever. And the reason for that is because NVIDIA's GPU was had a day job, and before that, before that, uh, uh, CUDA we put it on top of our programmable shaders. Yeah, it crushed our gross margins. I mean, you go back in history and you look at our look at our stock price on the on the generation that CUDA was announced, our stock was hammered, <laughs> and and the reason for that was because I added this giant cost into our company that. No, no customer value. You know, I, I still remember. I still remember calling customers and introducing uh, CUDA to them, and not one of them wanted it. They just, you know, they just wanted the old chip faster and cheaper. And and so, so I think that. But but nonetheless, nonetheless, uh, even if the customer didn't want it, so long as we're willing to accept lower gross margins. We could carry that technology to the marketplace, you know, and so, so I think the, the the rest of it is is really about selecting hard problems that take a long time that you're just essentially good at, but you have to have the skills to make money along the way, and and if you go back and chase down almost every initiative that we're currently uh, working on, we're making some money along the way, okay, and um, and. Uh, that's that's really that's really about skill, and the rest of it is just resilience. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Jensen, uh, it's it's funny that you mentioned that you raised me because uh, next month I I finish 21 years at Nvidia, so I can legally drink at the bar in Voyager. <laughs> so, uh, but. Uh, over, over those 21 years, I've seen you make a lot of good sequels. And uh, you're touching upon a little bit of what you said. The one that really stands out is, is in the second half of, of uh, the 2000s, um, when uh, you know, the economy wasn't doing great, and uh, you were under a lot of pressure from investors to just focus on the gaming business. You know, why are you shipping millions of dollars of silicon to customers that just don't care for it, right? And uh, and yet, you know, you showed 100% conviction in continuing to invest both in operating expenses in the R&D as well as in saying, you know, I mean, I have to say, I myself was conflicted during those years about, you know, does this make sense? Because you know, we we had a pretty competitive gaming business at that time, where you know, we, we weren't like just rolling through with with our GPUs and. Uh, so on the one side, we were under pressure to make sure that you know our, our GPUs for gaming were efficient, but on the other side, you wanted to continue to invest. So just take us back to that time and you know help us understand what was going through your mind as you were trying to push back against this this demand to just focus on shareholder value and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At all times, we're driven by aspiration and desperation. <laughs> And and uh, let, let me give you the let me give you let me give you uh, uh, that particular example. I'll give you one more example. Uh, but let me give you one example before. So there are three things that we did um, that profoundly uh, changed uh, how computation is done. Okay. So of course, of course, let, let me just ignore the first one that I already mentioned. The the, the zeroth one. Which is really about accelerated computing. That's 1993. Um, 25 years ago, we invented the programmable shader, and and the idea there was was uh, that every single pixel would become a program. Because prior to that, um, uh, every single pixel was just a texture lookup, just a color lookup. 
we would add a program to it so that the, the program could could um, uh, reference something else. So and before you know it, the, the pixel could be shiny, bumpy, you know, all kinds of things like that. Okay, all kinds of interesting programs can be written on top. That first inspiration is about the fact that that computer graphics it was going to be long-term sustainable can't all look like a military flight simulator. And so it has to be artistic. There has to be some way of telling a story so that you have all these different styles of video games. That was a, that was a giant breakthrough for programmable shaders. The second was general purpose co computation. And the inspiration there was um, if, if, if the world was only beautiful, but it was static, how would that possibly make for an interesting world? And if we didn't make, if we didn't bring physics into the world, if we didn't bring physics processing into the world, we have, you know, waves and, and smoke and fire and be able to simulate physics. Uh, we would just have a whole bunch of static looking images. And, and, and so I'm giving you the desperation view that our world, you know, our computer graphics world would, would run out of steam. And, and then recently, as you know, we introduced ray tracing. Uh, a, a, a new type of computer graphics that is inspired by physically based laws. Um, basically, instead of computer graphics, is now is now light simulation. Um, the the type of computer graphics we can the type of imagery we can generate is much much more beautiful, much more subtle, and and um, unfortunately the computation computation is insanely hard. Well, we, we came to the conclusion we have to do that because. Because um, otherwise, the the amount of of artists that it would take to make beautiful graphics was going to keep on scaling exponentially, and and uh, we would collapse under the own weight of our of our industry. Each one of these decisions, I described it in desperation. If we don't do this in ten years, we'll be out of business. And you have to convince yourself of that. Otherwise, you won't innovate. Does that make sense? And so I just, I just, I just gave you the backwards view, the backwards way of explaining how do we motivate ourselves to do it by convincing yourself you will die, <laughs> and and um, uh, by convincing yourself you will perish, and and it's not it's not hard to do that if you've been in the industry long enough. And the reason for that is because you just have to tell other stories of other industries or. Um, you just have to experience your own life experience in your own industry that, that because we didn't innovate, because they didn't innovate, they perished. Okay? And so, so we have to go and create that condition if we don't change the entire paradigm of how we do things. Literally put ourselves out of business. Notice ray tracing destroyed programmable shading, rasterization, of which we are, you know, the inventors of. And if we if we um, we came to the conclusion if we if we invented this it would literally disrupt everything that we've ever done. On the other hand, if somebody did it, you know, it would disrupt everything we've ever done. And so you got it. You got to come at it in a whole lot of different ways, and you come to a conclusion you have to innovate. The other way you, you do it is aspiration, which is look. This way of computation is not just for computer graphics. Computer graphics is a domain of physics simulation. When you take a step back and you say, you know, computer graphics is that way, well, I am certain that ray tracing will be the next step of lithography, computational lithography. Our current methods, our current methods are um, uh, broadly approximate. However, the ability for us to do ray tracing um, so, you, so you can deal with, you know, those deep, whatever those, those words that you use, um, uh, you know the layers between the layers between um, uh, metalization and this, and the, the narrowness the of trenches. The trenches are so incredibly high. Without ray tracing, it's very difficult for us to to figure out exactly how it's going to pattern. And so, ray tracing, of course, uh, is a form of physics simulation. Computer graphics is a form of physics simulation. The reason why we can sim simulate radars today, radars, uh, lidars today, is because we do ray tracing. Um, and there are many other other forms of physics that we, we could do because of ray tracing. Um, and so, so uh, our our generalization of what a GPU is, which is a physics simulation engine, 
um, was a great breakthrough. It was a, it was a great realization. You know, to take a step back and say, you know, we really simulate physics. And for Jeff Hinton, who uh, who said uh, once that deep learning is really inverse computer graphics. <laughs> let me just give you. Let me just prove the point. Let me prove the point right now. Okay. Um, I, I just want you guys to to uh, uh, listen to my words. Don't do anything but, but listen to my words, okay? And you apply your natural language understanding. And so I want you all to imagine a Ferrari. I want you to all imagine a red Ferrari, okay? Well, right now, you know, I didn't paint a picture. Did I? I didn't paint a picture. I didn't do anything. I didn't do any imaging. I want you to imagine a red Ferrari. But in your brain, you did computer graphics. Every one of you. Every one of you took red, R-E-D, right, Ferrari, and you turned it into an image. And so all of you did computer graphics. And, and deep learning is, in a lot of ways, the inverse of that. And so, so I think that, that realizing, uh, generalizing the problem space that you're in um, gives you this, this new aperture that opens up your aspiration. If we do this, maybe we can make a real contribution there. If we do that, we can make a real contribution there. And, and going back to what we were talking about earlier with VEC, how we choose problems, you know, we're choosing problems to solve that has great impact on the world, that is incredibly hard to solve, that we believe that we similarly are equipped to solve, which kind of goes back to the aspiration point that I'm making. When you open up the aperture of, you know, what, what, what is our true potential? What is our true potential? What can we really do? You know, what problems can we help to conquer? Um, what new frontier can we push further? Uh, and, and you teach your company how to, you know, ordeal pain and suffering for decades on end. Uh, what problem can't you solve? You know, and so that's, NVIDIA today is, is kind of the combination of those core values. and we have 10 minutes left. You've given us a lot of great nuggets already. Um, would you like to talk to us about some closing thoughts that you would like to leave the audience with? Well, you guys are horrible uh, conversationalists. Samir, I guess, I guess um, uh, uh, let me ask you, let me ask you, uh, and, you know, we, we've worked on a whole bunch of things together over the last 20 years. And, and um, uh, you know, what are, what are the characteristics of our company and what are the characteristics that you most value um, that, that allows you to do the groundbreaking work that you do? Because, you know, it, you, you know that, oh, so, so you guys know, Samir, Samir's organization is NVIDIA's VLSI Foundation. And... He's the person that gives us courage to go build these incredibly large, incredibly high skyscrapers. And we're not talking about 150 stories high. We're talking, you know, high. I'd like to build a skyscraper and it's, you know, 2,000 stories high, 20,000 stories high. And without, without his, his confidence in doing it, we would never undertake those kind of things. And, and um, uh, long, before, long before anybody uh, realized how complex GPUs are, uh, just to put it in perspective, you know, probably 10,000 human years goes into every generation. And all of us come together and we build this thing and we hit, we hit tape out. And when we hit tape out, uh, we assume that it's perfect. I mean, we don't assume it's broken and hope it's perfect. We assume it's perfect. And, and the reason why Samir knows that I assume it's perfect, because when I tape out the chip with Samir, I go to production. You don't unlaunch rockets. You don't untape out. You don't untape out chips. And so we, when we tape out, we tape out. And so, what what are the properties and characteristics of our company that, that allows you to do that and have that confidence? I, I think you you mentioned it. You've actually framed our company as a learning machine. You know, it's interesting that we are building learning machines, but we ourselves, as an organization, are a learning machine. You know, and uh, first of all, right, a very very big part of it is the fact that you were able to go from founding a three-person startup to running a trillion-dollar company. 
I mean, I think having a steady hand really it's it's underappreciated how important it is, right? I am certain that if it weren't for you being the founder, lasting through the second like 2007, 8, 9, and continuing investing in what has now become the foundational technology for everything that we do today would not be possible, right? But but you, like I said, even I myself was not sure whether it made sense, you know, to, to continue to go down that path because uh, high performance computing was only bringing us in maybe 200, 250 million a quarter, which was not enough to, uh, to sustain the R&D that it needed. But every single mistake, no matter how small, we just have this unrelenting focus to make sure that we understand why it happened and how we're going to make sure that it's not going to happen again. When you're building half a trillion transistor chips, GPUs, right? I mean, it's it's not possible to to build those if you have a 0.1 probability, percent probability of failure, right? Because that will guarantee that the chip is going to come back and not work. So your probability of failure needs to be 0.00001 percent, right? Yeah. And and that's really what you know. Every generation, every tape out, even if it is successful. We do, you, you would, if you go into our after action reviews, you would think this chip was a total failure based on the discussions that go on there, right? Because uh, we just take even near misses, we take very seriously. And so I, I do think that, and, and that's just not just VLSI, every single organization in the company, even go to market, right? After go to market, you know, Raj will do an after action review, what went right, what went wrong. Probably after this event, we'll do one. <laughs> so, yes. So I think that's the culture that you established from the very beginning of openness, of intellectual honesty, and, and that's really why. Yeah, you know, one of the things that, that you, you, you said, so learning, um, and this is, this is a, a personal characteristic of mine and also a characteristic of our company. We always remember the learnings. We always forget the pain and suffering. And this is really, really important. I'm saying something that's really important. You have to let the pain and suffering go. You can't be resilient if you if you if all you remember is the pain and suffering and not the learnings. You know, learn what you learn. Um, celebrate the learnings, right? Celebrate the learnings, and then move on. Uh, in a lot of ways, I just don't remember the past. You know, people ask me about the past, I don't remember. And the reason for that is I just remember all the learnings. And and so I think that that's a really important skill. The the other the other. Uh, the other characteristic that, that, that you reminded you reminded me of um, is uh, is the, the the kind of a joy in in um, confronting pain and suffering. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It must be the the the, uh, the feeling that marathoners go through, um, but. But uh, we, we really, I, I think there's a, uh, I used to use this phrase, I, I use it less now, and you know I used to say this almost every single day, is the entertainment value, the entertainment value of the pain and suffering uh, can be understated. And so, so. <laughs> in, in fact, you're, you're uh, the newest on, 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 this, on this team, and, and you're working on, on um, a really extraordinary thing. One of the one of the one of the challenges uh, that you have is is you were assi- you were a new employee and you were assigned a new problem. Our company is not in the semiconductor manufacturing business, and and uh, Kulitha is is spot on right in the center of the semiconductor manufacturing um, process. And, and uh, how how was it on the one hand? bringing this capability into our company, working on this new endeavor on the one hand, and on the other hand, tapping into the, the, the tapestry of resources in the company that you know, harness all of these expertise that come together to solve this problem in a way that nobody's ever solved before. Um, I think it goes back to something uh, Samir said and something I also mentioned in my question, which is this audacious goal, I think, recognizing which problem to solve uh, and setting a goal that nobody believes is possible, right? I, you know, I worked in this area before. I know the other people who worked in this narrow arcane field called computation lithography. And doing just a 2x seemed nearly impossible. Now, we burdened by the general purpose computing. 
but for you, Frank, as I think I've said to you, uh, 2x was hard for Jensen to say that we'll do an order of magnitude 10x was just, we didn't know how to, how to even come close. But somehow believing that it is possible, I think, uh, is, is a very big game. I think believing that something can be done is, is very, very important. And that was sort of, frankly, all Jensen. I've, I've worked at other places, and I know what the alternatives can be like. And to have a leader who's sort of technically that engaged. I mean, Saturday morning, I would get papers on inverse cartography from Jensen. I said, wow. I mean, that, that's just unheard of. Right? Ask me more later on about all the technical details Jensen has injected. The other thing is this uh, very flat organization uh, that has been created allows you to draw in from on, on the expertise of many other people. Places where I've worked on before, there's a lot of talk of transparency and fluidity and no boundaries, but in practice, I haven't quite seen it like I've seen it at NVIDIA. And, uh, so that combination, I think I said three things. Uh, a leader who can um, recognize the problems of the future, uh, a leader who has the appetite for all the technical, um, you know, complexity of that problem, uh, and then an organization which um, basically is truly boundaryless in spite of lip service having been paid to that term, uh, you know, at, I think several years Yeah, for, first of all, uh, Becky, the, the organization was, a company's organization is the machinery that allows it to do its work. And, and I find that a lot of companies are organized exactly the same way, even though they do very different things. You know, the way that you organize a fried chicken restaurant and the way you organize a chicken biryani restaurant you probably ought to be different. And the reason for that is you're making different things. And, and, and if you're building GPUs, you know, it ought to be different. If you're building chips versus what NVIDIA does, which is building a computing stack, it ought to be different. Um, and so, so I think the architecture of our company is designed to do that. The other thing is, is our, our company's architecture is, is designed to empower leaders. Um, and therefore, it makes some sense that, that at the highest level of the company, or the lowest level, however you might think about it, the, the number of direct reports to me should be the highest. And the reason for that is you're the most senior. And you don't need as much career advice. You don't need as much hand-holding. Um, the, the, tapering, the tapering of organizations uh, really struck, strikes me wrong almost at the very top or at the very bottom, however you want to think about the organization. And, and then the, the, the second thing I would say is that, that um, I, my greatest gift is actually being surrounded by amazing people like yourself. And all of you are teaching me about your domain of expertise. And uh, as you know, I'm a, I'm a, a generous learner, and so uh, I, I try to learn as much from you guys as possible in order to, in order to form the intuition about what's possible. You know, the, I, have, I have some background, and, and all of you have your background, and together we figure out intuitively what, is, what are the first principles, what are the governing dynamics, and what is, if you will, the speed of light of what's achievable. And, and that, that, I think, is, is um, uh, how we set goals in a company, uh, instead of letting some external uh, random third party decide how we ought to do. Uh, we have to decide on first principles how, how we should achieve. Okay. Well, I exhausted my time. Jensen, there's a line of people. Do you mind taking one or two questions? I am delighted to take as many questions as I'm allowed to take. <laughs> if or not, I'm time. Or, time or not, take okay. two questions. Okay. I don't want to extend my. I don't want to extend my welcome. This. I understand that this is. You know, I, I was hoping that somebody would ask me about about my last week in India. <laughs> Maybe you'll get that question, Jensen. Let's, let's see. We have five minutes. Come on. Let's do okay. That. So I was in I was in Gurugram. Uh, yes. By the way, Gurugram is, looks like the Silicon Valley of uh, of India. It's, it's grown incredibly since the last time I was there. Mm -hmm. I was Delhi. I was in Delhi uh, to uh, see uh, Modi ji, and and um, I, uh, I spent almost an hour and a half with him. Uh, he, he's incredible. Uh, the last time I saw him was five years ago. 
uh, pre-pandemic, uh, and I was there to uh, address the, the, uh, his cabinet uh, of our artificial intelligence, and he was, he was uh, very, very uh, inquisitive about that. Um, I told him several things. May I, may I do this? Absolutely. Do I have time to do this? I do Absolutely. several things. The first thing is I told him is that uh, India has its, uh, um, what is it, 23 languages, 25 different di- 2,500 different dialects. Um, you possess your own data. Um, you have a you have an indigenous market. It's a giant indigenous market. Indigenous market. Uh, you should not export data, export um, uh, everything, and then import the AI. What India should do is um, uh, import uh, the technology of, uh, of AI, but build your own AI and export AI. And, um, uh, he, and what he said was, uh, Jensen, that reminds me of, of something I told some uh, farmers once. Uh, let's not export grain. Let's export bread. Yeah. And, and that makes that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Don't don't export the raw material. Uh, India is going to be a giant market for AI. The second thing we, we spoke about is the the um, uh, the track the, the tractability of reskilling um, the entire IT industry of of um, of India. And this is the reason why I met with uh, Nanda. This is the reason why I met with Chandra. Um, uh, as you know, they revolutionized how IT is done and. Um, IT is way harder than AI, and and, um, I, and I explained that to to Modi uh, G as well. And then and then the third part uh, is um, to uh, formulate uh, partnerships with uh, large companies in India, uh, so that so that we could um, uh, together uh, uh, revolutionize the the, uh, the the industry again uh, together and um, um, and uh, uh, build AI in India. For India, and so that was that was really the mission of the trip. Thank you for sharing that. That's awesome. Right. So, Jensen, it's not easy to get to get you here. So, uh, since you're here, yeah. let's let's try to take some questions from our audience. I'd like to do it. I'm uh, we don't have a lot of time, but folks, uh, be selective about your questions. And we might have to cut it up at some point. So, let's go. Yeah. Prakash Ramji, the ATBS Emerging Open Technology Foundation Secretary. I've been hovering around Warshawi. And uh, the place Exodus was there is a place now by your own big towers. So I am very, uh, very uh, what to call, awed by your taking the question. And coming to the point, you went, you met Modi ji, you met uh, Indian uh, professionals and all that in India. Because you are uh, surrounded with all Indians here. Point here is you have CUDA computer unified device architecture. One. Second, you do have a unified approximation which you describe. What is your intuition and what is your uh, looking into national mission on quantum technology and application we are calling in the NMQT? What's your intuition? Is it fitting? Can CUDA absorb quantum, which is the future of uh, quantum, quantum computing isn't going to solve all of computing. Quantum computing is, is uh, right now specialized in what it can solve, the type of problems it can solve. Um, you know, as you know, quantum is, is very good at compute-intensive problems that are not very data-intensive, and, and which is the reason why uh, biology is an example, uh, cryptography is an example. Um, but data processing is not an example for for a quantum computing. Computer graphics is not a good example for com- for quantum computing. Um, and so, uh, how to arrange how to arrange uh, 500 guests at an Indian wedding? <laughs> is, is, uh, that would be that would be a perfect problem for quantum computing. <laughs> now that that problem is either for for uh, quantum computers or or uh, the mother-in-law. It's one or the other. <laughs> And so, so um, uh, the future of computing uh, will likely have a quantum accelerator for the for the for the for the few problems that that quantum is going to be quite specialized in. But even then, it's going to take a couple of decades for us to get there. Um, but in the meantime, uh, we use CUDA, um, and you, you probably know about uh, CU Quantum and and uh, CUDA Quantum, uh, where we're working with the quantum industry to 
architect uh, cl classical quantum systems. And uh, uh, in order to design the fastest computer in the future, you have to have the fastest computer today. And, and CUDA, CUDA GPUs is the fastest way to do that. Thank you. So extending on two sides, one on the communication. Let's have one question, please. Yes. Okay. Let's, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. My, my name is Sanjeev Bode. Uh, I work for Infosys, and thank you for meeting Nandan. He has always been talking about you ever since. Yeah, he's um, in fact, I think uh, apart from Bollywood stars, you were the one who managed to wear a jacket, a leather jacket, in, in Indian <laughs> humid conditions. I don't know how you managed that. Um, in fact, I was in Italy just two days ago watching Da Vinci, and Jim Kramer, my guru, talks to, about you as, as a Da Vinci. So it's a, it's a pleasure, really, to see you in flesh and blood. Yeah. Can you have the question, please? Yes. Bharat, you have been there. Arnav, I was still really enjoying that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we are getting into this. I'm just we may never get out of this. <laughs> you might be stuck here for all day. I don't know. I'm, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> Thank you. The question so I'm a social media influencer, and there is, uh, ever since Nandan spoke about your interactions with him, there was a lot of questions about saying, well, NVIDIA and companies like you, AI is out there to take my job. What is the message you would like to give, not only to India or Bharat, but to the rest of the world? There's a whole section which is drinking from the Kool-Aid saying AI is going to destroy the future, which might not be true, but what is your take? I would like to hear that. Um, AI will definitely shape, reshape the future of work. There's no question about it. I'm going to use a lot of AI. Samir, Samir already uses a ton of AI. And, and uh, Vivek uses AI. Uh, all of us are going to use AI. And we're, none of us are afraid at all that we're going to lose our job to the AI. We're all afraid that we're going to lose our job to somebody who uses AI, and we don't. And so that's, that's really the answer. I think the, the, the first thing to realize is you're not going to lose your job to AI, you're going to lose your job to somebody who uses AI. Um, the second thing is, is we're all going to be augmented by AI. The, the future chips that Samir builds will be impossible without AI. In fact, the current chips we build are impossible without AI. But we just don't talk about it. But AI is all over our company, and we can't do our jobs without it. And, and, and we're not going to be unique. Everybody's going to be the same way. It's going to augment um, and uh, turbocharge the work that we do. Now, ultimately, the question is, is it good? Is it good for the world, for industries to be more productive? Now, I just asked a very sensible question. And, and people usually go all the way to the limit. If the, if the industry is infinitely productive, meaning no humans are necessary, then we're all going to lose our jobs and, and we'll, you know, we'll just be like Star Trek, one around the universe. Um, however, to the, so, that, so, so long as we realize we're not going to be infinitely productive, but we're just going to be more productive, then more productivity helps every industry. I don't know one industry... We just who says, guess what? You know what? We just want less productivity. I think we're just going way too fast, and, and we're doing things way too well. Now, I, I would I would say that there are some industries uh, where where uh, productivity may not be helpful. For example, uh, raising a child or nurturing a child or something. You know, I can imagine that uh, productivity is not helpful. Uh, and enjoying uh, enjoying your garden because you want to do it, you want to use your own hands. Uh, you know, maybe having a robot do it on your behalf not what you're looking for. Now, I can imagine a lot of things like that, but most industries are looking for more productivity, more safety, um, you know, more repeatability, more certainty. Two more questions, please. Thank you. Uh, Jason, thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Vivek Kumar. Uh, I've been in the semi industry for almost 14 years. Uh, first as a data engineer and now as a product manager. Uh, I'm a quantum now. My, I have two questions. I'll stick with one. Um, so, uh, you made semi-industry, for the lack of a better word, sexy. Uh, and especially since the movement from predictive AI to generative AI, all the hyperscalers now are uh, changing to GPUs. Do you think that this is a, a PC era type of situation where if it's hardware, then software will dominate? Or is that a more sustainable story for the hardware? Yeah, appreciate the question. The, um, <coughs> uh, VCs tell me that we were singularly responsible for them investing in chip companies again. And, and um, I, I think that that's an overstatement, but I would say, I would say that 
that AI is is a is a seriously groundbreaking thing. Um, and the reason for that is, is several reasons. One, the type of applications that we can now um, go and solve and go do are are unimaginable in the past. The, the things that we were talking about earlier. But at the pro, at the foundational level, at the foundational level, the computing stack has changed. Um, the, the simple logic is this: we used to program our computer with with either um, uh, programming languages like C++ and Python, or domain-specific programming languages like SQL, or for example, CUDA is a domain-specific programming language. Um, and now we're programming the, the computer using uh, human language. And, and that's another way of saying that everybody is going to be a programmer. And this is one of the, this is one of the, the points I made with, with, uh, with Modigy, that this is, this is, a, this is a, an, a, an incredibly important moment in time for India. And the reason for that is, is the, the people that were left behind by the last technology divide, that, you, know, you know that, that uh, computer science has created a larger technology divide, not reduced it. And the reason for that is the number of people who know how to program C++ is really small compared to the number of population in the world. But the number of people who can chat is basically 100%. And, and as a result, everybody knows how to program a computer now. And so what does a, what does a programming model look like in the future? Uh, you're probably starting to hear about these things called Langchain and Langflow and things like that. Basically, what it, basic, what, what it is 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 a chaining of AI models to create an application. You figure out, hey, what is, what is an intelligence that I'm looking for here? What, problem, what, what kind of problem do I want to solve? And what intelligence do I have um, that I can go get an AI model? Maybe the, I chain it with another intelligence model that I know is really good at this, and I chain it with another intelligence model. What am I doing? I'm assembling a team. I'm literally assembling a team, a team of software. I connect them together graphically I just take your output, connect to that, and and you you the team members know how to communicate with each other. If anybody can communicate with ChatGPT, then any AI model can communicate with another AI model. They'll figure it out. They'll negotiate among themselves and figure out what's the best way to communicate, and they just and they create maybe even their own language. And so this this way of assembling software in the future is unimaginable today. Could you imagine that in the future, you don't have to program software, you have to assemble AI teams? That's the future. So the programming model of the world has changed, the type of application has changed, and, and um, I, you know, maybe another way of thinking about computing and why, why it's so profound is, is um, uh, for the longest time, the hardware was general purpose. But the software is really brittle. You have this application called Excel. You have another application called Word. You have another, and they're singular applications. Now, all of a sudden, the hardware is specialized. And because the hardware specializes insanely fast, in the last 10 years, we accelerated deep learning by a million X, a million times. That is so much more than Moore's Law. It's unbelievable. And so, so now, the hardware is incredibly fast, but the software on top of it now can be general. Does that make sense? So, so the, 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 the programming abstraction has flipped on its end, and because of that, um, computer scientists are, are, are so incredibly excited about the future of computing. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, opened up a whole bunch of new possibilities. Thank you very much. I have a small Thank you, Hold on, hold on, no, no, please. There's only one more question, please. Okay. How about the question that he asked to Samir about uh, when you hit the tape out, it works out. Uh, I had uh, <coughs> offer from India three years ago. I couldn't join, but one thing I can't know is uh, India has every uh, tool at the disposal that makes it work. So as I was told that you have to make the chip work because we provide you every single tool at the disposal. We need a lot of tools to make things work. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Okay, this is the last question, folks. So sorry. Uh, hi, I'm Tamil Shai, Do you want to see? Um, you are such a visionary, of course. Um, so if we are talking to you three years or five years down the road, or if you were here at this conference. What is the most sophisticated uh, application you can imagine um, you can share with us? What would be the most sophisticated thing we could do? The two, the two applications that I mentioned, I, was, I mentioned right away. And uh, one of them is protein engineering, bio, uh, engineering biology. And then the other one is, is uh, the digitalization of heavy industry. 
to bring AI to factories, to bring AI to buildings, to build, build you know, to, to bring software um, to everything that we do. You design everything in software. Software languages. I don't mean CAD. I mean software languages. And through software languages, it generates a building. Through software languages, it generates a, a factory. Through software languages, it generates, you know, the chassis of a car. And when you do that, when you do that, the chassis of the car won't be over-engineered. When you do that, the, you generate, of course, the shape and the form, you might be, you know, human, human inspired. But the rest of the generation of it, just like logic synthesis, if you will, the rest of the things that, that, that affect rebar and cement will be auto-generated by AI. And that generative process would result in a structure that is, that is stronger, that is lighter, uses less waste. And so I've now described two problems that were impossible to be software-defined in the past because we simply didn't have representations of them. But in the future, we'll, we'll be able to represent them in software and languages, and we'll be able to generate them using AI. Okay? Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.